Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, we might make a, a beginning to the evening, if that's all right with you. We might have a few people coming in over the next five minutes or so, but, um, but that's fine. Um, firstly, just um, I'd like to um, start with an acknowledgement of country. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people and the Kulin Nation, the custodians of the land on which we are gathered, and pay my respects to the elders past and present and to extend respect to other Aboriginal people present. Um, and just before we begin, just want to um, go through what you might have on your tables. So hopefully you've picked up the uh, booklet on your way in, um, and you can refer to that for our presentation, and feel free to take notes on that. Feel free to take that home with you um, uh, for, further, for more information later on. Uh, there's also some little post-it notes, so I apologise for the minute size, but we thought that might be another way during the presentation if you had any comments that you wanted to make or questions that you might have, you're welcome to write on those post-it notes, um, stick them on the table and we'll, at the end of the presentation we can go around and gather them up. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go through what um, the evening will be all about and introduce a few people. Um, so firstly, just want to draw your attention to Angelique de Brinker. Um, she's our acting principal who's just started this year. Um, and she'd be, yeah, she's uh, excelled in fairly well so far, Angelique. Great. Um, so we're going to hear from Tom Felton, and he's the maths um, coordinator. Um, where's Tom? There he is here. He'll say a bit more about himself later on. Um, we're going to hear from Emma Crampton. Um, she's a Maths Pathways Coordinator. Uh, we're going to hear from Belinda. She's a Maths Pathways Tutor. Um, and we're going to hear from some classroom teachers as well, um, Tom Patton and Steph Kears. Um, we've, there's a fair bit in the presentation, and it has been planned as a presentation. Um, we hope that there's enough information in there to um, so for our new families to give lots of background about our, our maths program from seven to nine. Um, and, and also that there's enough information for our eight and nine families that, that, may, um, that they may want. Um, we'll, there'll be a short activity during the presentation as well. Um, and then obviously we'll hear from some of our classroom teachers later on. So firstly, I just wanted to set the context of um, uh, the approach that we're taking in maths. Our, our goal is this year, it's the same goal that we've had for the last, I think, at least four or five years, and it's essentially about optimising the learning growth of every one of the students at the school, and with the emphasis on growth. Um, and we feel that um, the Maths Pathways program um, in, in junior maths really allows us to do that. And you'll hear more about that later on. The smaller booklet that you might have has some information about um, our college instructional model. Um, this is a model that we developed collaboratively with the whole staff um, last year. Um, and it's essentially a statement about what we think good classroom practice is. Um, right from before students and teachers enter the classroom, um, what happens during the class and what happens afterwards. And I just wanted to draw your attention to this one here which is all about empowering students to take control of their own learning. Um, and we feel, again, that, that this is a program that, that teaches all of those skills as well as the actual maths content. Okay, so I'm going to pass over now to Tom Felson, um, and he'll give you a bit of an overview of the total maths program. All right, welcome everyone, and um, I don't want to go through the program in much in detail, because. Emma and company are going to do that pretty much. But I think it's a good idea for you to know, it's important that you know, what we have to offer from 7 to 12. Um, and as you can see, when kids come into Year 7 at Bliss Grace City College, we don't know a lot about them. Um, we do obviously use the program, we are committed to the program, and we'd like to think that the program does work, but with support of other resources, and that's how we pretty much make it work. Year 7 is all about consolidating, and that's where they come in. We do a variety of assessments, and one of the most important pieces of assessments is the Pat Maths test that we do. 
kids would have either done it by this stage or they're in the process. Um, we do that for the next three years. We gauge them at the beginning and we gauge them at the end. So that gives us an idea. So we don't rely totally on the program to tell us where the kids are at and what directions they need to take pretty much. The following year, year eight, we continue with that program and hopefully we extend the kids with some, you know, with further obviously um, support and resources. So at year seven and eight, it pretty much becomes a program where the kids are getting used to what is probably a new type of mathematics. And it is digital, it's, in, it's new. I mean, you know what age we're in, so we've got to go in that, that direction. Year nine, this is the first year of year nine, we're obviously implementing the program. And we're, we're finding that the kids obviously are getting on board with it a hell of a lot better. Only the reason being is because they've done it for two years, they know what the program is about, they know what's obviously expected of them, and obviously with the, with the support that we provide them, they can go even further. Now what they've got at year nine though, on the other hand, is that we do provide them with, with support in another way, and that is through electives. I mean, we do offer electives at year nine, Year seven and eight, as you know, are pretty much core subjects. But there's no sort of electives in those areas, in those year levels, sorry. But at year nine, we do offer electives in all the key learning areas. And in mathematics, we offer pretty much two key, obviously, electives, and they are advanced algebra. And for obvious reasons, is that they, that's an area that Footscray City College seems to think that that's an area that we find at the senior level, that's where obviously they need to get support, <laughs> provide them with the best opportunities at VC level. So the other one, the other elective is financial literacy. Now, obviously, you've heard out there how important financial literacy is. It's a government push. It helps them obviously with subjects like further mathematics, and that's where that's the reason why we're doing it. And you know, today we talk about superannuation. We just we're not just about mathematics. We're about trying to get the kids to learn a little bit more beyond maths. And pretty much what it means is the kids have got to know a hell of a lot more than we did probably 40 years ago. And if they're not aware of that, they don't know where their money is going, they're obviously going to find they're going to have difficulties. Okay, so year 10, we pretty much mirror our, our, um, our uh, program on the year 11 program. And as you can see on the board there, we have maths for the future, we offer general maths, and we offer advanced maths. Now, as you can see from the arrows, maths for the future leads on to foundation mathematics, and then from foundation maths, that leads to VCAL numbers. So, then you've got general mathematics. General mathematics is probably the middle level of mathematics, and that leads on to general maths in year 11, which then leads on to further maths in year 12. So I don't want to go too detailed about this, but I think it's important that you know where your child is, is, is heading. And then you've got advanced mathematics, well, that's the name we've given it anyway, and that leads on to maths method and specialist maths. And we offer each one of those maths every year for the past number of years now. Um, our numbers have been good. Specialist maths, on the other hand, people, a lot of people ask me and say, look, you know, should I do specialist maths? I'm reasonably good at it. But we need to be aware that it's not a prerequisite. It hasn't been for a prerequisite for a number of years now. Universities don't expect that. But maths method, and obviously, is a subject which kids do have to think about if they do aim to go to university. Um, I think that's probably about it. I don't want to say too much more, but if you do have any questions in relation to where your child wants to go and where they're heading. Um, what's important, I think it's, uh, it's, you've got that opportunity a little bit later on. But obviously, we take uh, calls of you want to contact me in relation to any of our programs, please do so. We've got, a, we've got staff here who are happy, happy to help out, so please come on and uh, ask us any questions. I'll pass you on to Emma. Thanks, Tom. Um, <coughs> So my name is Emma Crampton. I've probably met quite a few of you and you've seen me talk at the end of last year for the Year 7 parents about Maths Park Day then. That was a very short forum I had to speak. So we're hoping to, to bring out a bit more of the program tonight for you. Um, so like I say, I'm the Maths Pathway Coordinator. I'm also one of the uh, coaches at the school. I work in numerous years, but I um, coach some of the other coaches as well. Um, so what I want to start with, I'm going to show you a couple of short videos. Um, our first one is from Salman Khan, the founder of Khan Academy, um, and he was, he was talking about teaching for mastery. And then our next one is about the core um, beliefs behind Mass Pathway, and 
really why we are using the program at the school. I'm here today to talk about uh, two ideas that, at least based on my observations at Khan Academy, are, are kind of the core, the, the key leverage points for, for learning. And it's the idea of mastery and the idea of mindset. And I saw this in the early days when I was working with my cousins. A lot of them were having trouble with math at first because they had all of these gaps accumulated in their, in their learning. And, and because of that, at some point, they got to an algebra class and they might have been a little bit shaky on some of the pre-algebra. And uh, because of that, uh, they, they thought they didn't have the math gene or they'd get to a calculus class and they'd be a little bit uh, shaky on, on the algebra. I saw in the early days when I uh, was uploading up some of those, those videos on YouTube and, and I realized that people who are not my cousins were watching. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, at first those, those, those comments were just simple thank yous and I thought that was a pretty big deal. I don't know how much time y'all spend on YouTube. Uh, most of the comments are not thank you. <laughs> They're uh, a little edgier than that. But then the comments got a little bit more intense. Uh, you know, student after student saying that uh, they had grown up not liking math, it was getting difficult as they got into more advanced math topics. By the time they got to algebra, they had so many gaps in their knowledge that they just couldn't engage with it, uh, and they thought that they didn't have the math gene. But when they were a little bit older, they took a little bit of agency, and they decided to engage. They found resources like Khan Academy, and they were able to fill in those gaps and master those concepts, and that reinforced their mindset that, that it wasn't fixed, that they actually were capable of, of learning mathematics. And in a lot of ways, this is how you would master a lot of things in life. It's the way that you would learn a martial art. In a martial art, you would uh, practice the white belt skills as long as necessary. And only when you've mastered it, you would move on to become a yellow belt. It's the way that you would learn a musical instrument. You practice the basic piece over and over again. And only when you've mastered it, you go on to the more advanced one. But what we point out, this is not the way that a, a, a traditional academic model is structured, the type of academic model that uh, most of us grew up in. In a traditional academic model, we group students together, usually by age and around middle school age and, and perceived ability, and we shepherd them all together at the same pace. And what typically happens, let's say we're in a middle school pre-algebra class and the current unit is on exponents. Uh, the teacher will give a lecture on exponents, then we'll uh, go home, do some homework. The next morning, we'll review the homework. Then we'll get another lecture, homework, lecture, homework. That'll continue for about two or three weeks. And then we get a test. And on that test, maybe I get a 75%, maybe you get a 90%, maybe you get a 95%. And even though that, that test has identified gaps in our knowledge, I didn't know 25% of the material. Even the A student, what was the 5% they didn't know? Even though we've identified those gaps, the whole class will then move on to the next subject probably a, a more advanced subject that's going to build on those gaps. It might be logarithms or negative exponents. And that process continues. And, and you immediately start to realize how, how strange this is. I didn't know 25% of the more foundational thing, and now I'm being pushed to the more advanced thing. And this will continue for months, and it'll continue for years, all the way to at some point, I might be in an algebra class or a trigonometry class, and I hit a wall. And it's not because algebra is fundamentally difficult or because uh, uh, the student isn't bright. It's because I'm seeing an equation and they're dealing with exponents and that 30% that I didn't know is, is showing up. And then I, I start and then I start to disengage. And to appreciate how, how absurd that is, imagine if we did other things in our life that way. Say home building. <laughs> so we bring in the contractor, say, told we have two weeks to build the foundation, do what you can. <laughs> so they, they do what they can, maybe it rains, maybe some of the supplies don't show up, and two weeks later the inspector comes, looks around, says, okay, the concrete's still wet right over there, that part's not quite up to code, I'll give it an 80%. <laughs> Say, great, that's a C, let's build the first floor. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah, we have two weeks, do what you can. Inspector shows up in two weeks, it's a 75%. Great, that's a D plus. Second floor, third floor. And all of a sudden, while you're building the third floor, that whole structure collapses. And if your reaction to that is the reaction that you typically have in education, or that a lot of folks have in education, you might say, maybe we had a bad contractor, or maybe we needed better inspection or more frequent inspection. But what was really broken was the process. We were artificially constraining how long we had to do something, pretty much ensuring a variable outcome. And, and we, we took the trouble of inspecting and identifying those gaps, but then we built right on top of it. So the idea of mastery learning is to do the exact opposite. 
instead of artificially constraining when and how long, fixing when and how long you work on something, pretty much ensuring that variable outcome, the A, B, C, D, F, and do it the other way around. What's variable is when and how long a student actually has to work on something, and what's fixed is that they actually master the material. So um, that identifies a problem that we were trying to come overcome with Maths Pathway. Um, the next video is just the core beliefs of behind the program, what we hope for all of your children. We believe that courses should be structured in a way which serves student learning, not an assessment schedule. Assessment shouldn't be something that you put in a mark book and forget about until reporting time. Instead, assessments should be ongoing and formative. And provide not only a picture of where the student sits right now, but guide the next steps of what they learn. Student learning should be front and centre. Assessment should only exist to enable learning to take place. And reports are simply there to draw upon that data. I believe that students should learn maths in a variety of modes. When you're in class, you shouldn't feel rushed trying to get through all the dot points on the curriculum. Instead, class time should be balanced. There should be room for handwritten math skills to develop alongside digital technologies. There should also be room for real world applications, group work and deep discourse. Students must graduate with creative problem solving skills. And the ability to apply the knowledge they have gained. I believe that my relationships with the students are critically important. The time I spend on explicit instruction and preparing work should not push everything else into the background. Instead, explicit teaching should remain part of the mix. But the most impactful and enjoyable parts of teacher practice should move into the foreground. Like providing feedback. And building the student's self-confidence. I believe that students should deeply understand the maths that they are learning. And enjoy that learning. Students shouldn't just wrote learn a bunch of new recipes each year, forgetting last year's recipes. Instead, they have to form deep conceptual understanding. This will allow them to problem solve. Then they're able to transfer that knowledge into different subject areas. And definitely the real world. We believe that meeting the learning needs of a diverse range of students requires them to be learning different mathematics at the same time. We should not be batching students into a one-size-fits-all production line. Where well, everybody is expected to meet the same age-based objectives. Instead, I believe we should be meeting the individual needs of every single student. We can only build mathematical understanding cumulatively. With new learning drawing from an existing understanding of the sub-concepts. All students. All students. All students. All students should grow along a continuum from wherever they happen to be. Okay, so um, basically we get to the main business here. What is Maths Pathway? Um, as you should all be aware by now, Maths Pathway is an internet-based program. Your student, your child accesses it, accesses it through their uh, Chromebook for 7s and 8s or so their uh, netbook for the year 9. Um, students sit some really sophisticated diagnostic testing so we can place them on that continuum of learning. It diagnoses their gaps and we know where we need to work with your student. That diagnostic then unlocks modules, which is like your traditional textbook exercises, I guess, and that is based on what they're ready to learn. So that, the program maps out an individual learning pathway for your child, but it, the program is not just about what is happening on the computer. Our learning cycles for Maths Pathway, we operate in a two-week learning cycle where we are constantly giving our students feedback and testing the knowledge that they, you know, their new knowledge and testing for mastery. Our classes will look different depending on what day of the week that you get there to have a look at them. Um, the diagnostics sit outside of this learning cycle because we only do them once. We do them once, we do, try to do them well, and we've pretty much we get that level based on what this child has gone through in primary school or before they've come to our school. Um, students work through modules at their own pace. We set, we set a guide of six per learning cycle. That's what we aim for, so that's only three a week. It's a very manageable number. But within those classes, we also do projects once a semester. 
we do rich tasks which you will get to experience later on and we do our testing. The students are building their own tests based on the work that they're ready for and the work that they are confident to be tested on. So the two, week of, two weeks of maths is nine periods. Um, the timetable will dictate when somebody's cycle starts and ends based on double periods and, and things like that. We don't like to give tests first thing on a Monday morning because that can be unfair for kids that didn't get to revise. Um, you'll see that the majority of those lessons are called module lessons or, and slash mini lessons. So that means that students are taking the ownership of their learning, working on their modules, adding them to their tests, and that frees up the teacher to be running those targeted teaching mini lessons with the students at their point of need. Those mini lessons will happen <coughs> consistently while modules are happening and different students will be pulled out at any time to do those mini lessons based on their need. Sometimes it's one-on-one -on -one if your child is the only person needing that skill at the time. Or we, we tend to aim for about four to five students in each of those mini lessons. Um, we give them revision and then a cycle test, um, which you can see the modules and cycle tests. There are examples in your information booklets there. And then we do our reflection and feedback with our students. Um, Maths Pathway, there's a, approximately 50,000 students in Maths Pathway in the program across Australia. Now, there's lots of misconceptions out there about the program. There's, everybody has different experiences um, and hits different things through people, through uh, students, even sometimes uh, their voices, they might not be the most reliable at times if it's something that they don't particularly like. But there are misconceptions out there and I'm hoping to dispel a few of them for you now. So we've got 50,000 students across Australia in public, private and independent schools using the program. Um, one of the most common misconceptions is that it is just an online program. So Maths Pathway is so much more than just an online program. Students are still expected to use their workbooks and complete their maths in the traditional way. However, the program gives them access to an online worksheet that has been diagnosed as work that they are ready to learn. To accompany this, they have access to work solutions, to assist them with problem solving, videos to guide them, and other activities. Students also work closely with their teachers and peers through mini lessons and problem solving activities, which we call rich tasks. Throughout the evening, you'll be able to see how this program is not just an online program. Rather, it is a tool for the teacher to gain a better understanding of your child's maths understanding, and enables them to assist your child to reach their full potential when studying mathematics. Our second misconception is that the teacher doesn't teach your child. The role of the teacher in the classroom is now very different to what it used to be when you or I were at school, um, especially with this program. There is much research that has shown that lecture-style lessons, as just like this one, are extremely ineffective for student learning, hopefully not in this case. Particularly in subjects such as mathematics, where students learn most by doing the teacher is still very active in the classroom with their students by offering feedback and guidance to individual students, as well as working with the small groups in the form of mini lessons. This targeted help is more useful for students working on an individual program. Students are encouraged to develop independent learning skills with getting help, and um, that means that we do encourage them to look at answers, so we give them the answers, it's not cheating, we want them to work backwards from the answers if they don't get something. We want them to try to watch an inform informative video on the process to see if they can work it out. We want them to ask their peers. If those things don't work, then they come and they seek help from the teacher or by that stage we will have already grabbed them into a mini lesson. We want them to seek other avenues than to just ask the teacher when they first hit that struggle point. Our third misconception is that students learn better from a textbook. Textbooks are usually pitched at one level. That is, if your child is in Year 7, you would purchase a Year 7 textbook. However, if your child has gaps in their knowledge, that's 
algorithms below this, they will struggle to understand the new concepts being taught to them. Conversely, if your child has already been extended in maths in primary school or their junior years, um, the maths that they're ready for will be at a higher standard to what's in that textbook. The diagnostics and cycle tests available through our program ensures that your child's learning program in maths is continuously updated to their specific needs. Uh, in the graphic here, um, which <coughs> Stephanie will go through later on, what it actually all means, but this is data for a whole class. And as you can see indicated there, that's the level of a year seven textbook. Now this class, we're looking at the light yellow for each of those rows. None of the students, and this is a very typical year seven class, nobody came in at that level based on the gaps in their knowledge. It's not saying that they don't know prerequisite skills for that or they're not ready for some of those areas at Year 7. It just means that largely there are gaps that need to be resolved before that, that textbook would make sense to many, many students. And the last misconception I'd like to deal with is that Maths Pathway won't prepare your child for VCE. So to prepare for VCE, students must have had access to the Victorian curriculum at levels 1 to 10. The Maths Pathway program is completely aligned with the Victorian curriculum and by providing students with an individual program, it will ensure that gaps in their knowledge are filled before they can access work that is higher up in the continuum. Teaching this way will arm students with skills in critical thinking, communication, creativity and collaboration through all the different modes of teaching that we do. Um, and also the self efficacy that it builds within the students. You need to you need to be able to push yourself to a degree in VCE. You need to be studying, you need to have that drive and this model does support that for our students. So I'm going to throw to Steph Pierce who is one of our Maths Pathway teachers. Okay, at the beginning of the school year each child is a blank canvas. The diagnostic tests that we run allow us to see which of the strands, substrands and concepts of the entire maths curriculum your child has already mastered. This diagram here just represents the entire maths curriculum all the way from level one up to and past year 10. Um, and our curriculum obviously broken up into three strands and multiple substrands. The four adaptive tests, three of which are shown here, are used to assess which content and skills the students have already mastered. These tests are supposed to, sorry, spaced over several weeks to ensure that students <coughs> have the best chance to demonstrate their prior understanding and don't succumb to testing fatigue. Between tests, students are introduced to Math Pathways modules, expectations and engaging rich tasks. Diagnostic testing is important as it not only shows us what students already know and what maths they are bringing to the classroom, but it also identifies the gaps in their knowledge. These gaps, often in foundational concepts, make it more difficult for students to obtain and master more advanced content. Maths, as with all subjects, is more easily learnt in succession, where each concept learnt builds upon prior mastered knowledge. Gaps in this knowledge therefore requires students to make greater leaps between concepts. These images here just show how interrelated the concepts are and how important foundational concepts and modules are to higher maths. In this far image all the way over here, this one concept, which is looking at place value in decimals up to four decimal places, that one concept is needed for all of these modules and all of these um, higher learning later on. So missing out on this makes all of this a little bit more difficult to obtain. As well as diagnostic tests, students also sit fortnightly tests as part of their learning cycle. <coughs> These tests are specific for each student and are only based on the modules the student has completed during that cycle. As part of the testing cycle, uh, students also participate in reflections on their learning with the teacher. And just as a side note, in those handouts that you have, we've got an example of a module that a student will be presented with, as well as a test that has some of those questions based on that module.
During the feedback session time, teachers have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with each student to discuss their effort, growth and accuracy and to set learning goals and, and importantly how they're going to achieve them for the next cycle. This running dialogue is also recorded and allows both the teacher and the student the opportunity to develop positive learning behaviours that can improve their learning in not just maths but all of their subjects. Uh, this image here shows the average knowledge over the entire maths curriculum for students in an average Year 7 class. Um, it shows us both the, the knowledge that they have at the end of the diagnostic testing as well as at the end of the year. So in this image here, each column represents a student. The pale yellow section shows us the average amount of mastered knowledge that the diagnostic test picked up. And the dark yellow is the mastered content after that diagnostic test over the year. So as you can see here, in a typical Year 7 class, the mastered math levels can differ up to five levels just after diagnostic testing. What, it, what this also shows us is that even in a typical class, most students on average don't start at level six, um, and that's because there's big gaps in their knowledge. Math Pathways is a platform that allows us as teachers to shift the dialogue we have with students from how much they don't know or how far above or below the Victorian Curriculum Assessment Authority determined levels they are, but instead focuses on the learning that they have actually achieved. Here we can see two students, um, both which have similar learning growth over a, a one-year um, time frame, but who had two very different starting points. This shift in focus obviously allows us to you know, focus more on the positive mindset of what students have achieved instead of focusing on a deficit model. And now I'd like to hand over to Linda Rutherford, who is our Maths Pathways Tutor um, and who provides support both to teachers and students. Hi everyone, I get to talk to you about the fun stuff that I really love students enjoy every single fortnight. So, sorry, wrong way. What are our rich learning tasks? Well, they're a core cool part of the Maths Pathway Teaching and Learning Model, and they provide the students with their invaluable problem solving, collaboration, and fluency skills. So, the tasks that we provide are accessible to all the students, so they have multiple entry and exit points, and they focus on their problem solving skills, as well as um, their critical thinking, and they create a lot of mathematical discussion that they wouldn't normally have within the typical classroom. So these lessons take place at least once per fortnight, and during those uh, lessons, they're working collaboratively while the teachers lead the discussion. So, um, while the modules and the mini lessons target the content descriptors of the curriculum specifically, Rich learning addresses the proficiencies in the curriculum of understanding, fluency, reasoning, and problem solving. Rich learning tasks don't necessarily need to align to the dot points in the curriculum like the modules do. It's more important that they provide an opportunity for students to deepen their conceptual knowledge and understanding of the big mathematical ideas and encourage creative thinking and problem solving to bring out the interesting questions and discussions. So, what we're going to do today is we're actually going to do a really quick modified version of one of the activities that we run with the year eights. So on the inside of the very front cover, there's a grid there that says pentominoes, and that's where we're going to do this activity today. So what is a pentomino? Most of you here will have seen or heard of dominoes before where they're broken, the tiles are broken up into two equal squares. Well, pentominoes are very similar, except that they have five squares, okay? So, here is an example of a pentomino. And a couple more. And what I'm gonna to post to you is, are these other pentominoes? I see a few heads shaking in the crowd. Okay, some saying yes, they're the same, some saying they're different. They're actually different. No, they're not. They're all the same. Okay, they've been flipped or um, just turned around, rotated. 
So they don't actually count as different pentominoes. So on your page, you've got texts or pens in your hand. I want you to draw as many different pentominoes as you can. You've got about one minute. Go for it. Okay, I'll just get you to pause there for a moment. Unfortunately, we don't have all night to do the activity, as much fun as it is. So what I'm going to ask of you is, if you've got six or more different pentominoes, raise your hand. Cool. If you've got eight or more, raise your hand. Couple. Uh, if you've got ten or more, did anyone get that far? Yes. If you've got twelve or more. Close. Okay. So, yes, we've got one. Ah, excellent. So we've got twelve up the back there. Luckily for us, twelve is the answer. And here are all the different pentominoes you may have drawn. Typically in a class, after the students have got all these down, we ask them to cut them out. And then we're going to ask them to arrange them into a rectangle, a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. Okay, there can't be any gaps and there can't be any overlapping pieces. So like most of our rich tasks, there can be more than one solution. So for this uh, rich task, there's in fact 3,719 different solutions to this problem. Okay, so for the first rectangle, there's 2,339. For the second, there's 1,010. For the third, there's 368. And for that final one, there's only two solutions. Okay, so it gives all the students an opportunity to succeed. So throughout the activity, the teachers will be asking the students a number of prompting questions and that will get them thinking about what they're doing and why they're doing it. And that's all I've got time for today. I'm now going to pass over to one of our other Maths Pathways teachers, Tom Cutton. Alright, evening guys. I'm just going to quickly sort of try and illustrate um, a little bit about what a typical Maths Pathways classroom looks like. So, We've been getting sort of pretty caught up in the, the high-end stuff, diagnostics, uh, learning for mastery. But what does it actually look like on a daily basis when the students sort of come into the room? So one of the main sort of concepts that we sort of work off is this sort of idea of module work. So working off the modules from Math Pathways does take up quite a lot of the time. And so what students will do, and the way I like to set up my room, is provide the students with a little bit more independence than they'd often get in the classroom. So they'll come in, they'll arrange their tables in the in a, in a U shape, so that I can see their screens as they're sitting in the classroom, and then in the middle there'll be another there'll be another table for mini lessons. So they they come in, they set themselves up, and they start working independently through their modules. And so this gives them greater agency over their learning and gives them sort of a clear idea of you know what they're trying to do. Um, next up, so the next sort of I guess major concept that we work with are mini lessons. So mini lessons, I'll identify an issue that a student has. I'll draw them maybe sort of four or five together into a group. We'll then sit together at a table in the centre of the room and using manipulatives, sometimes just worksheets, sometimes just discussions using mini whiteboards, we'll try and break down some of the problems that the student is having and discuss sort of what we can do to fix it. Um, the third thing is then rich tasks. So once a week, maybe every, every fortnight, we'll do a rich task of some kind. So this breaks up the module work. It gives students a chance to do a little bit more collaborative work, a little bit more discussion with their peers, um, and so this will have, like, just like the other we discussed. Um, and then the final thing that I suppose you'll see in the standard sort of classroom is the tests. So they do happen pretty frequently. So every couple of weeks, students will be sitting their tests. And so this is a lot more. This is a much more independent sort of phase of the process. So students will be sort of working through the test individually. Then the second component is doing their reflection, so they'll do this reflection, and then finally they'll have a discussion with me sort of about what they can do better next time. So it's while the classroom does look somewhat different, there are some you know some differences. There's still a lot of sort of similarities to the you know the classroom sort of that everyone else is, is used to. Um, and I think that was roughly all I was going to discuss. I hope that's given everyone you know some idea about what they would see if they walked into a Pathways classroom, you know, tomorrow. I think I'm passing over now back to Emma. So I'm just going to talk about now um, what 
you as guardians can do to support your child through their maths education in the, in the junior program here at the City College. Um, this is a very long slide, but basically um, what you're going to notice most different, I suppose, from their last maths report from primary school is that you might notice that their levels are a little bit lower. Um, this doesn't mean that your child has gone backwards. It doesn't mean that they didn't get taught these things at primary school. It just means that with our sophisticated diagnostics, we have isolated those areas that are now that are fuzzy and, the, and your student has had trouble recalling during their diagnostics. So they're not, they don't know them well enough to recall them in the time of need. So while the diagnostics, well, while their level will go down a bit on their first reporting cycle, they will make up that time a lot quicker and those levels a lot quicker than in a traditional model. Um, across all of the students using Maths Pathway in Australia, the average level coming in from the diagnostics is level four. So we know we're not just getting kids that go four standard into high schools, which just we're being a lot more specific with the way we're testing them. Um, and also, teachers aren't able to gauge every level of the curriculum minutely, just like this program is. So you know, we can't gauge those gaps as well as this program. And there is a lot of data for us now. So generally speaking, to have good skills in maths for life, as measured by Maths Pathway, students should have up to about a level seven, which is the end of year seven in general speaking, but it won't be that solid. They'll have higher concepts and they're just life skills. Higher than that, they look like they can be dealing with different um, VCE subjects. This is our third year. We're getting better every year with the way we're delivering our program. So um, we've got our year nines doing it now. They'll go into year 10 next year. We'll be able to really get a sense of the program and even more with the coming classes after that once we've had enough users in our system here. What you can really do to help us teach your children is make sure that they're equipped for class. I know that's, that's a no-brainer, but they do need their charged computer in every class. They do need their books, pens, rulers, anything you would need for a traditional math class. Um, just encourage them to have their equipment with them. So you can access all the information about your child that we gather in the system. It's a very transparent program. Um, you won't have access to this right away after the students have done their first, um, first sorry, cycle test. Um, the parent portal will switch on for you. And you'll be able to see what the diagnostic said about them. And you, I encourage you to look at that and reflect on how they went through um, school, uh, maths in primary school. Maybe there was a problem in grade four and they didn't quite get it. And maybe that you can see that that gap in their knowledge is a direct result from that. Um, you'll be able to see their current growth rates, all their test results, um, their curriculum grid, and the modules that they complete. And there's a hyperlink there that you can click on to see the actual worksheet that they've done. You can access that through their own as well, but it's just another way to do So this is what you should be looking for when you do log in. You log in with your child's account details. Um, we will be giving them to every parent at parent-teacher interviews. Uh, if you want them before that, you either ask your child or you can email their teacher and we can give you that. Um, their data is for you to see. Um, you have a number of options to look at. There's also a help button there. Math Pathway has very good um, custom support. Um, you can go through to the parent and carer details. We encourage you to put your information there and you'll get an email every time they do something amazing in the program. Just every time. Um, and it's here. It's really important that that's there. That'll send you an email and you can keep them up to date without trying too hard then. Um, it will also give you uh, 
information on, we've got a new thing called, oh, it's not there. There is a parent activity, a family activity that you might like to do with your family just to keep them up to dialogue. So in order to assist with your child's learning, we just ask that you keep um, the conversation positive and focus on their growth. Try not to focus on deficit language. We want their confidence to be high in that. We want them to think that they can come and they can do something as long as they work hard towards it. In your handouts there, um, you have a sheet written by Professor Jo Bowler from um, University of Stanford. She is a big one in the mindset movement uh, about growth mindset. She looks at growth mindset in mathematical context. Um, she has an awesome website called YouCubed. She's got ideas there for how to deal, how to support your child. So I encourage you to look at that. Um, I will be sending these slides out digitally over the next week or so with the recording of tonight. Um, so you'll be able to click to the links and, and things like that. And we've always got Homework Club to support your students as well. So it happens here, the Monday to Thursday in the library. Uh, Belinda will be in attendance. I'm here some of the times too because I'm one of the librarians at the school as well. Um, some of the Tuesdays Linda won't be there because we have her in our meetings then where we plan um, more interesting rich stuff for your, for your children. But we encourage students with low growth to come, not low level. So if you have a, have a child that is a bit lower or under the age standard, but they are doing all that they can and their growth is good, we don't, we don't need to see them at homework club. We really want the kids not getting work done and not having that moment and doing their homework, um, which they will need to do if they can't manage to get their modules done in class, that becomes homework. Um, so yeah, so it really, it's a different model, we're not targeting the lower kids. Yeah. Yeah, um, so as far as, I just realised I didn't mention that, when they do the module work, um, we have six modules we ask them to do per fortnight. If they master three of them, which is only a 50% on a test, that gives them a growth score of 100%. They could do that every learning cycle for the whole year and grow exactly one year in one year's time. So that's the benchmark. Three modules mastered out of the curriculum gives them a growth of one year, age level, level wise. The standard or average growth across this college is um, is at about 130 to 150%. Um, classes do vary. Um, you get the biggest growth usually from, from the students that are actually the lowest in understanding because they're finally having work at their level and things are clicking. So they do have a, a bit of a growth explosion at the start of the program, but things tend to level out towards the end. So we would like our students to be aiming for over 100% growth because they are very capable of doing that. Um, within the parent portal as well, you can all also um, find out about any of the things we've talked about um, and you can also contact us. Communication is key. Please keep the dialogue open with your child's maths teacher. Um, discuss the concerns you have, even just they don't even have to be concerns. Just please talk to us. Um, you can talk to me at any time. You can email me or, or call me. Um, I'm happy to take calls. We've got some upcoming dates. So where you can further talk to teachers. We've got the Year 7 barbecue for the Year 7 parents next Thursday. And then we've got our parent teacher interviews, which are a whole day on the 3rd of April. And that's where you most likely meet your child's maths teacher for the first time. They'll give you uh, an information pack with your login details and the growth for your child for the term so far. Um, it's really important that you highlight any issues to us, that you do talk to us, because if we don't know that there is an issue, we can't address them. Um, even if it's negative feedback, we do need to hear that because we need to, we need to act. 
So I, I thank you to the parents that have contacted me and, and other people at school about the program. It makes us grow and it makes the program better for your children. If you have any feedback on today's session or further questions, um, could you please you can fill in a form? I've got a, a tiny URL there so it would be easier to type in. It is in your information packs in the slide printout, so you don't feel the need to write it down right now. Um, and likewise, you can write a question on that um, post-it notes if you can fit it in there um, and leave it on the table and we can send some answers to those because chances are you are not the only parent that has those questions. Um, right on schedule. Um, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out of your evening to come down. I know it's, it's hard when you have a busy week um, and we do hope to have a lot more nights like this and like I said we have recorded the evening so if you wanted to re-watch it or um, let other parents know that couldn't be here that will be um, forwarded out via Compass uh, in the next week or so. Thank you very much.